Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in New Zealand, but thanks to the invitation from Simon and Mark to comment on Carolina and Brad's keynote on tuna stock identification. They're the experts on the topic, and my role is really just to quickly give a broader perspective. I had hoped to present live, but uh, gave Mark this recording as a backup. So I guess if you're listening to this, something went horribly wrong. Um, as an introduction, I'm a stock assessment scientist working in the North Atlantic. My research and education have focused on demersal species like lobster, flounder, cod, haddock, redfish. For those of you more statisticians and coders, those are not tuna species. However, I have some experience with Atlantic bluefin tuna. As I was studying demersal fisheries in the 1990s, a debate was raging over the population structure of Atlantic bluefin tuna how that should be represented in stock assessment, how it could be considered in fishery management. Uh, one outcome of that debate was Clay Porch's VPA 2 box, which is a fairly conventional age-based assessment uh, package, but it also allowed for spatial structure and the integration of information like tagging and stock composition. Um, that really blew my mind. That was a collision of my two worlds of stock assessment and stock identification. Um, I had a man crush on Clay Porch ever since then. I mean, look at him, how could you not? Uh, but I've also had a fascination with tuna, with electronic tagging, otolith chemistry, spatial modeling. I've been involved in ICAT assessments. Um, and really, I think the tunas add diversity to our understanding of population structure uh, their movement rates, the large spatial scale of the same processes I was studying for demersal stocks uh, was much larger. Um, and Atlantic Bluefin Tuna was the cover model for the first edition of the IC's uh, Stock ID Methods Working Group. Um, however, despite the interesting features of tunas, I think the main message of my comment on tuna stock ID is that they really shouldn't be treated as a special case. I think the main message is that the basic approach to stock identification, the assumptions of conventional stock assessment models, really apply to all species and fisheries. Um, and you know, here are some examples where uh, demersal bivalves um, have spatial heterogeneity, we often have spatially structured stock assessments. We have spatially rotational management strategies. Lake Whitefish was the uh, case study in which the genetic stock concept was developed. Deep sea redfish um, have reproductive isolation by depth, uh, even though they're live bearers. Uh, if we go all the way to marine mammals and orcas, uh, we have behavioral groups that are reproductively isolated. And we've learned about these population structures using the same general approach to stock identification. And the same approach applies to the population models that we use to assess this diversity of species. And so I'll start where we ended off last fall at the CAPM workshop on good practices for stock assessment. In terms of stock identification, uh, we concluded that the most plausible population structures should be inferred from interdisciplinary sy synthesis of all information. We have a variety of tools in the toolbox for stock identification. They each tell us something uh, distinct about the population structure, but no single tool gives us the whole picture. So we really need to uh, integrate the information from all of these different approaches. We should summarize the information available in every stock assessment report. And if there's any new information that's become available, we should try to reconcile that with traditional approaches and add that to the synthesis of information. These days in climate change and shifting distributions, uh, we should also routinely test the persistence of spatial patterns uh, to detect if there have been any shifts in, in the spatial distribution of the fishery or the resource or any of the geographic variation and patterns within the stock. Uh, and then finally, if there are any information gaps, um, we should form research recommendations to attempt to fill those gaps in future stock assessments to hopefully uh, represent the population structure better 
in stock assessment and fishery management. So how can tunas contribute to this and what approach should we take? Um, as I said, there are some special aspects about tunas. Um, their migration rates, uh, the highly migratory aspect um, really makes us um, zoom out and take a larger view of the spatial scale. Uh, larval retention areas and nursery areas are still important. Uh, but those now may be entire ocean basins, uh, for example, the spawning um, grounds for Atlantic bluefin tuna in the Mediterranean Sea or the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, juvenile and adult dispersal is now transoceanic, is that the movement rates are faster. So even within seasons, there can be long distance migrations. Uh, the boundaries among populations and subpopulations may be defined by oceanographic features. So rather than geographic features or bathymetry, um, we now may have oceanographic features that are changing over time. And then practically everything is larger. Um, so we have highly migratory straddling stocks that are straddling EEZs, straddling the high seas, and even straddling areas of different uh, inter governmental organizations and agreements. So despite all these special aspects of tuna, we still need to focus on the spatial distribution, geographic variation among areas, and dispersal of fish at early life stages and late life stages among areas. Some of the methods we've developed for other species are applicable to tunas some of the practical solutions that have been developed for stock assessment and fishery management are also applicable to tunas. And I think uh, taking a step back is that we'd all benefit from taking a unified approach to stock identification. Um, and so that we can learn from each other so that tuna scientists can learn from demersal scientists and vice versa. Uh, rather than taking a special treatment for tunas, marine mammals, shellfish, or any other taxa. Um, if we treat them all with a unified approach, we should be able to advance our science uh, more efficiently. And so again, I'll, I'll end off where we ended up last fall um, for the CAP, CAPM workshop on good practices and stock assessment when it comes to spatial boundaries and structure. We concluded that complying with the unit stock assumption may be the most important structural decision in stock assessment modeling is that the stock boundaries and the strata definition should be based on the most plausible population structure and routinely evaluated and we can iteratively advance information on stock identification how it's represented in stock assessment uh, so that we iteratively approach an optimal geographic specification for meeting our management objectives as we apply more and more advanced methods to marine populations, we're finding more and more fine scale population structure and that many of our fishery resources are spatially complex. Uh, this presents a challenge. Um, our relatively simple conventional models may perform well for representing those spatially complex populations and in informing fishery management, but they may not. Um, and so I think we're compelled to do simulation testing using a spatially complex operating model and testing the performance of conventional simpler estimation models. The challenge there is conditioning these complex operating models. Um, and so I'm very hopeful that the development of spatial modeling, spatial stock assessment methods, uh, for example, the spatial assessment workshop that uh, took place last week, can help advance um, and develop best practices in spatial modeling so that ultimately they can be used uh, directly to inform fishery management. But even until then, they may help to condition um, these spatially complex operating models for simulation testing. And so uh, Mark and Simon had asked for any questions that we can, should consider uh, for the workshop discussion. And so I pose these, uh, are there any other aspects of tuna and tuna fisheries that should require special attention for stock ID? How can dynamic stock boundaries and spatial strata be monitored and defined routinely in the stock assessment process? And then finally, if stock ID suggests that stock straddle 
Tuna Regional Fishery Management Organization boundaries, is there a process for coordinating stock assessments between those regional organizations? So with that, thanks again for the invitation and I'll look forward to the discussion.